Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Chris Carruthers uh, from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And uh, we have begun a, a collaboration with him and uh, LNL uh, on uh, simulation, especially uh, extreme parallel simulation. And uh, he'll be bringing us up to date on, on how we're collaborating and joining the power of, of his ROS system uh, with Charm++ uh, to produce sort of a next generation simulator. All right, thanks so much, Eric. Um, so first off, uh, thanks to Sanjay for inviting me here. This is a really relatively new project um, between, as uh, Eric pointed out, Lawrence Livermore uh, National Laboratories. In particular, uh, Peter Barnes is the PI from there. Peter Barnes and David Jefferson from Livermore. And then sort of working backwards, we're working with Nikhil and Eric as well as Sanjay. And from my side, we have uh, Elsa Gonzarowski and Justin Lepree. Uh, and I'm also, in addition to being a professor, I'm also the director of our Center for Computational Innovation, where we have a small blue gene queue, small meaning roughly five racks, roughly about a petaflop. It's kind of funny we think of a petaflop maybe being small, but uh, relative to the size of Mira and Sequoia, um, but it's a, it's a good, good machine uh, it, for, for these types of things. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some of our activities we've been involved with. Uh, in parallel discrete event simulation, sort of really how this project came to be, and then sort of what we're, we're sort of hoping for it. Uh, in particular, I'll be talking about sort of, you know, the, the motivations and what, what started with a really a big push, and I'll, I'll, I'll jump into that first. A little bit about background on our blue gene Q systems we got to work on and, and play with. Um, the, the name of the, the simulation system that we developed at, at Rensselaer is called ROS, and I'll be talking a little bit about its current implementation, and then be pulling some details out about what we're hoping to do with, with Charm++. And then our sort of scaling results we've obtained so far just in its current implementation and where we're hoping to, to move that with Charm. Uh, in particular, we have a benchmark application called P-Hold. For all intents and purposes, P-Hold is the LIN pack of parallel discrete event simulation benchmarks. Um, and then I'll provide sort of a bit of overview of the project. You've seen actually some of the mini-app results earlier. I'll make some comments about there. And then this actually also dovetails into some additional other projects we have going on. And so I think there's going to be a lot of uh, synergies and impact there. So to be start off with, um, the gentleman here on the your far right is uh, Dr. Richard Linnerman, who is the chief scientist of the information director at Air Force Research Labs. And he had spoken and was funding some of our work at the time in doing gate-level simulations. Um, at the same time, he sort of, I guess, was working with uh, Peter and David. And uh, sort of a, th a three-way collaboration developed where he said, I have no money to spend, but uh, would you please mind doing a scaling study for me? And in particular, we had done a scaling study before where we were taking our, our discrete event simulator and running it on, um, at the time, Intrepid. And he wanted to see, well, what could we do on Sequoia? And so again, we were really trying to push the limits of, of scaling these things. Again, this is an optimistic discrete event simulator. So for those of you who've heard of Time Warp, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that if you haven't, David Jefferson is, in fact, the inventor of the Time Warp algorithm. And we wanted to see, well, you know, what would the scaling results be? And we thought, hey, you know, this is going to be straightforward. Um, it really won't take a whole lot of time. Um, and that could have been nothing further from the truth. Um, so first off, uh, the Blue Gene Q architecture, we, you probably are somewhat familiar with it already. Um, but a couple of great points about it are, one, um, it, it's a 16-core architecture, four-way hyper-threaded. But um, I think we just heard before in the, the, about Jitter, uh, there is this sort of magic 17th core hanging out there on every node that sort of is where the operating system runs dedicated on it. And so it hides almost all any of the OS operations there. And so you tend to have a very low jitter system uh, to date. There's some other, other things that they've done in the BlueGene family to do this. Um, the flops per node, roughly around you know, almost 205 gigaflops per second, uh, or gigaflops, 16 gig of RAM. Um, memory bandwidth, um, the peak, 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 best case, I guess, is close to 43, although stream and talking with Vitaly at Argonne National Labs, you're probably limited to more in the, the high 20 gigabytes a second. Comparing that with your cache bandwidth of almost 563 gigabytes per second, there's a really strong bias here to try to stay really in your, 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 your or sorry, your L2 cache. Um, very power efficient, of course. Um, and again, we've got the 5D five, five, five torus at 2 gigabytes uh, per second per uh, link. Um, again, a rack is roughly 
uh, is 1024 nodes, uh, 16K cores, and then essentially the way we tend to run it, and most people do, is you tend to oversubscribe your threads to uh, our MPI tasks as we run. And so you'll typically run um, 64K tasks or ranks per core. Um, so then we, or I should say Peter had access, I actually did not have access, which I think complicated some of the things with our project. Um, he was making the runs on Sequoia at the time. Now, as far as I knew at the time for Sequoia, it was a 96 rack Blue Gene Q system with roughly almost 1.5 to 6 million cores, 1.6 petabytes of RAM, and it had a 5D torus, pretty well balanced, 16 by 16 by 16 by 12 by 2. The E dimension in the torus is always held at 2 on the blue genes. Um, but little did I know at the time, this was a little over a year ago, for about three months they were doing some, I guess, acceptance testing of the machine and some benchmarking. And so they took the 24 racks of Vulcan and quietly just squished it together with the 96 racks, creating Super Sequoia for a while. And you ended up with this wonderful, uh, nearly two million processor system um, for, a, I guess, about two months. The interesting thing was is the torus and took this sort of strange shape. Part of it's in the wiring. So the A dimension went to 20, by, went to 20 from 16. Uh, so you had a 20 by 16 by 16 by 12 by 2 uh, system. The implications of this are your bisection bandwidth were not going to increase. So you, you increased your machine by 24 racks, but you didn't really gain anything in the bisection. So we were sort of interested, you know, the, we didn't realize this at the time, but we weren't sure, I mean, in, in hindsight being 2020, are things still going to scale, and what, what are the implications of this? So this is sort of uh, now talking about the Ross parallel discrete event uh, system. Um, it's written actually in pure sort of ANSI C, executes on a number of different platforms. We've used Craze and BlueJeans and various Linux clusters. It'll even run on your Mac laptop. We do that all the time. Um, it's open source, so you can go to ross.cs.rpi.edu if you want to download it and look at it and play with it, kick the tires on it. Um, so in terms of the way the system works, and this is just in general for time warp, discrete event, similar systems. So time warp, unlike um, you might have heard earlier, or a conservative style protocol sort of blocks on the chance that there could be any sort of uh, dependency among events in the system. And it's really hard to predict these dependencies, right? And so the time warp philosophy is don't worry about that stuff, right? Let's just be speculative, and if we have an error with respect to calculation, we're going to roll back and fix it up. So this sort of detect and rollback type mechanism devolves really into two uh, pieces to the algorithm. The first one is this local control algorithm, right? And so the idea here is you've got a collection of, of what we call logical processes. So these are really the objects in the system. Uh, you can think of them, um, in some level, they map maybe partially well to a char, um, for those of you who are familiar with that. Um, but it's just essentially an a, a, a entity that you might be able to wanting to simulate. It could be a node within a network if you're doing a network simulation. Um, so the idea here is that then the LPs are just going to be able to send messages to each other. Um, and then if they detect an error with respect to causality, meaning out of order event uh, computations, we're going to actually roll back. right? So we've got to undo state save, saving changes, and we've got to send these cancellation messages. Now, this actually introduces a, a pretty interesting phenomenon, which you can actually get these cascading rollback effects occurring within such a system. Um, so it can go really unstable very easily if you don't have a, a, a handle on that um, through some correct memory management, or correct decomposition, uh, mapping of things, as we've just heard about the mapping. So a lot of things can, can potentially wreck, this, uh, wreck the train here for, a, for, for time warp within it doing uh, rollbacks. Now, what we do here that's sort of interesting, though, in terms of rolling back, is we don't, we don't actually save state. Instead, we actually do a reverse computation, up to an in, even including the random number generator uh, for the particular application. Um, so a lot more I could be saying about reverse computation, but essentially for, for every forward event uh, in the system, there is an anti-event that actually does that exact inverse calculation through, through a series of techniques. In terms of the messaging, we use asynchronous message passing, immediate sends within the MPI layer. Um, and this is a place we're hoping to, of course, improve with, with using Charm++. Um, we have to manage and go through the details of all our network memory here. Um, we allocate our pools. Um, there's some other details here about how we have to deal with uh, anti-messages being sent across the system, which, again, an anti-message is sent. It's tracing down an incorrect calculation that was sent in the system. 
Um, the under, so keeping the events in order, we use basically a spray, spray tree. And then finally, um, how do we map these logical processes to cores? Again, if you're talking about having a system with billions of objects or something like that, uh, you cannot basically have a hard map table uh, on every core. So we actually uh, compute that uh, uh, on the fly. All right, so the second part of this, so that's the, the first part of the algorithm. The next part is uh, a global control algorithm. And so essentially, you can imagine we're still having to be able to support the rollback mechanism. And so then part of this is, well, we, we need to be able to reclaim memory as we use it, particularly the event memory. And so to do that, we define a lower bound on all unprocessed or partially processed events in the system, and it's called the global virtual time. And anything less than that time, we can effectively reclaim. What you see here is we actually have a synchronous version of this algorithm, which is another point that we could potentially improve using charm plus plus. Again, we have to count up all the messages. We do an MPI all reduce. And from there, we can ultimately calculate uh, what the GVT is across everything. Um, and so again, we, we really rely heavily on the fact that the Blue Gene Q has a very efficient uh, collective uh, uh, capability here. Um, so again, we wanted to see how this is going to translate into performance. And so again, we, we, we use this synthetic uh, benchmark. It's sort of pathological in some sense. And we were looking at a pretty large so we're, uh, uh, simulation because we wanted to be able to see how far we could scale. So we had roughly 251 million LPs. Right, uh, 40 LPs per MPI task. And again, this was an MP, uh, MPI everywhere implementation. Um, so originally, we were designing for 96 racks of Blue Gene Q and roughly 6.2 million MPI ranks. Um, at 120 racks, this became uh, third, only 32. So we had very little work, actually, uh, per MPI task and 16 initial events. Um, and here's the other, ca other piece. Of all of these events, 10% of them are scheduled randomly across the whole system. So in some sense, it's a little pathological, at least for discrete event systems. Um, and so you could have, you know, you could be going far across with, within the network. Um, the other 90 is local. So you're guaranteeing to send, well, local to your to yourself. Or to, to no, to, to actually you, you initiate to, within, to the LP. Um, the other piece is sort of interesting, and this gets into the, Yes, absolutely, pretty much, because there's just so many. Yeah, there's there's no like uh, intermediately local work. It's flying usually flying far from you within the torus. Um, the last piece is is we had a very relatively low look ahead, and this is an, a key point is that the nice property of, of time warp is it sort of automatically uncovers the parallelism uh, in the sense meaning. Normally, what conservative algorithms rely on um, is look ahead. And you have to have a large degree of look ahead relative to your timestamp increment. Um, here we had relatively low look ahead. Um, we've we've got done conservative algorithms. Um, at this level, you probably time warp runs probably about a factor of three faster um, at scale, approximately, from what we've seen. Um, these are some internal ROS parameters we set. Um, essentially, how, fa how frequently we're going to compute this GVT algorithm and how many events we're going to process between checking the network stack. Um, and there's some, some other pieces as well. Um, we also have the ability here, again, determinism within these systems is really, really important, repeatability. And so we have the ability to essentially give each LP its own set of seeds. And those seeds are guaranteed not to be correlated for the most part, because you're never going to call more than 200, 2 to the 70th events within any one LP. So, so we've, we've set the seeds apart very well. All right, so, so this is the, the setup. Um, this is sort of just the C code of the implementation. I'm going to skip over that for in the interest of time. Um, in terms of our performance, uh, we, were, we did some, some scaling sort of test runs on our blue gene called Amos, our five rack system. Um, at the, at, we were doing this, it was only two rack. Um, so we, we mapped out an implementation that, that was at 40 LPs per, per MP, uh, MPI task we were running. So it was a similar workload, just maybe not as many core, or cores or MPI ranks. And then for the Sequoia runs, um, uh, we, 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 got our, we got our shots. There were sort of uh, many, many, as Peter can attest to, many, many failed attempts, things that might not have worked out. Um, essentially, we had two series of experiments that ran largely in uh, early or January and early February of 2013, 1 to 48 racks, and then a second set in mid-March where we finally got the 120 rack runs. 
and then after that it went down. And again, everything we did here was um, deterministic, meaning every run we ran from one rack out to 48 or out to 120, 120 racks, they got the same number of events processed. Identical uh, results came out of the simulation. Um, so this is the first set of results we did at this time, which was we were running it. Uh, we were trying to look at, well, where, you know, there were, at the time, uh, the notion of running 64 MPI ranks per, um, per node was sort of, you really shouldn't do that. That's just something you shouldn't think about doing. We did it anyway, and it turned out that that was the best case. That was our best performance case, running at that level. And the reason why, actually, uh, turned out to be sort of interesting, if you go back into the IBM um, sort of, I guess, the red book, I think around on page 500, 480 or 500, there's this interesting little thing that talks about the processor's pipeline and it says that on a correctly predicted branch, you will incur a five cycle penalty on a correctly predicted branch or a function call effectively. So it's a product of the fact that this processor is an in order uh, pipeline. So it doesn't do out of order execution. Um, and so by actually having and doing over decomposition and having a lot more threads, you, you gain the additional hardware contexts, and so then you can sort of hide the latency a little better of, of, these, of, of, any of, of any of these sort of correctly predicted branch delays. All right, so, so that turned out to be the best case. Here is our first result out to 48 racks, and big eye chart here, but the big one was we got out to 164 billion events per second. Now, in perspective, this number may not mean so much to you now, but the previous record we'd ever done before was 12 billion. So we'd already gone, you know, order of magnitude plus over that. And the other interesting piece is we were seeing a 75x speed up uh, going from uh, 1 to 48 racks at, at sort of this peak event, at, at, with that peak event of 164 billion. So we were excited, right? We were excited. And so we, we, we went to the, we were saying, wow, we're getting good performance. And so we think, thought we needed to define a really a new speed metric for measuring these things. Because, well, quite frankly, 164 billion gets hard to write. Um, it gets to be, uh, so we were looking at, well, could we define a new metric? And uh, I think David coined the phrase warp speed, with no apologies to Star Trek. And so the definition became, if we take the log of the event rate, log base 10 minus 9, and, and so then we could start creating a number and start scaling this out. Um, and uh, so, so, you know, we felt like, you know, we're, we're doing, doing okay. And then we wanted to see, well, what if we got a full machine? Now, at the time, I thought the full machine was 96 racks. David calls me up and says, oh, no, it's really 120. Um, but unfortunately, we, weren't we were not able to obtain a full machine run at the time. Peter spent many, many hours, many tries. We thought we had a ROS bug. Fortunately, it was not within ROS. Apparently, there were issues within the lower level uh, message passing uh, system. Uh, the Pandy layer had problems. Nobody was getting above a 48 rack run at this time. Um, we've, we sort of found out. So our solution was is wait. We had to wait for IBM to come out with the e-fix. So finally, we got the result. This was the result we were looking for. So we, we re-ran our results, and a couple of inter interesting things happened. One is with this one e-fix, it actually improved two rack performance by almost about 10%. Um, but then finally, we hit 120 racks, um, and we were getting, again, very good efficiencies. So efficiency is essentially the um, amount of forward computation uh, completed without having to roll back. So essentially, 92 out of every 100 events processed were roughly being uh, done forward correctly. So we were having very low rollback overheads. And the final number was we were really, really running close to half a trillion events per second. Uh, so we were, we were pretty excited by this. And so this sort of plots out the, the scaling that we saw. If you plotted this out using a base of, of just the two rack base. And so it, we were. 97 times greater in speed up for 60x more hardware. And again, the, the, the short answer here is, is that it, it's the cash, right? Um, we were fitting essentially a majority of this calculation really in, 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 L, in the L2 cash. Um, if you just look at quick performance history over time, we've been now scaling uh, very nicely uh, really since we've really started been using these machines um, with the, really the first result coming back and. and 2005, this is Kalyan uh, Pramula's result uh, using uh, the Blue Gene L systems. All right, so coming full circle to our project, so we're seeing uh, very good performance. Um, and uh, so this led uh, the folks within the Department of Energy, in particular uh, uh, Peter's management and, 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 and Peter and David themselves, to think about well, what about billion object simulations, planetary scale 
simulations. In fact, that became the title of the project. And this became a three-year project that was uh, officially funded starting this past January. And there were two key applications that we're interested in. One is a distributed denial of service attack on very big networks, so internet-style networks. Um, and then as well as like a pandemic flu virus. So, so with, with this, though, we, we knew we wanted to go after these models, but we knew we, we, we still wanted to improve Ross's performance further because there were certain uh, limitations to it. Um, and so we wanted to have this sort of shift uh, to, uh, from MPI in particular to Charm++, and this is going to be a great opportunity. In particular, the reason for this shift is we knew that if you do the, the back math, we were running at about 4 million events per second per MPI rank, right? Um, or Sorry, per node, sorry. I know, if I look at a blue gene Q node. If I actually have a threaded version of ROS that runs on a single node, there's 7 million events per second using the same configuration, meaning the same workload. So the point is, is that there's room still left to improve, about, we think, between 25 and 50%. Um, and so we'll, we'll make some gains here by, by moving to shared memory. We'll get much lower, we, we hope, lower latencies from, from um, by moving to uh, uh, Charm and going directly access, it's access to the PAMI layer. An asynchronous GVT, we know we probably spend way too much time in, in GVT. Um, and then finally, the one thing we really are missing is we don't have a load balancing capability. So we just do static decomposition, um, and so it can, via using the Charm runtime system, nearly scalable results. And so, uh, thanks to Nikhil and Eric, they've already jumped in and created, you know, a, sort of a PDIS mini app, and you heard about it uh, earlier this morning in Charm++. And this is where we were going to really gain knowledge about, well, how should we map uh, really Charm++ into a PDIS framework? One of the key challenges really here in this mapping, actually, is the fact that ROS is implemented in C, I mean, it's sort of a software engineering piece, but it's implemented in C, and so it can't really fully take advantage of all of the object layering that, that Charm uh, offers. And so we, we're going to have to think very carefully how to, to do that mapping from taking something in C without changing the C API, because we have models in C that we want to preserve. Um, so this is one of the, uh, one of the key pieces of work we'll be doing. Um, and coming back to the mini app, it uses a conservative protocol. It's grouping the LPs as chars, uh, ran on TAC, and one of the interesting things is aggr message aggregation using the, the, the tram capability, uh, which we heard proved to be uh, very useful. Again, just to quickly review from this morning, you might have seen, if you, if you missed this, uh, this was sort of uh, one of the, the performance of Miniapp running out to 4,096 processors, millions of events per second, which is uh, good at this, very good at this scale, uh, particularly for a conservative uh, uh, simulation. So here you can see where the, the density of LPs per PE, uh, that tends to, to win you uh, more, uh, more events per second. Also, um, uh, finally here we see where the uh, not using TRAM actually has a really significant impact on performance, but using it with a lot of events uh, per LP, we see a, 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 they see a big win there. Um, and so that's, that's very good. Um, so sort of in closing then, um, beyond this project, so beyond being able to, 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 to model these large pandemic, uh, say, flu viruses or a, a distributed denial of service attack, um, I'm also involved in a number of other activities which, thi which the, ac the work we're doing here to, to improve ROS, I think, will, will also uh, be brought to bear here. In particular, we're working with um, uh, Rob Ross at Argonne National Labs on what's called our code, CODES project. CODE stands for co-design of exascale storage. So we're doing modeling and simulation. So we're using really leadership class hardware to sort of model future exascale uh, or very large storage systems. In particular, we're looking in the next stage, these virtual data facilities, meaning uh, across which there's actually a picture there that uh, Windows decided to, to X out for me, but essentially a, a virtual data facility running over um, the, um, the science network of the Department of Energy. Additionally, Thomas Opelstrop at Large Livermore is looking at how uh, he can improve the performance of kinetic Monte Carlo uh, simulations uh, and is trying to build that on top of ROS. Finally, we're involved with the design forward activity, uh, Phil Heidelberger at IBM. So we're looking to take their Venus models, which are uh, uh, the network models that IBM has constructed, and use ROS as our, the core simulation engine for running those at scale as well. And so again, all of these activities have the potential to be improved by uh, using Charm++ on these. And thank you. Let's thank our speaker.
Any questions? Actually, one quick comment. I think the improvement with CHAMP++ will not come, well, will come only st in a tiny measure with the improvement in P hold from that, uh, the excellent result that you have. But in the more complex situations involving load imbalances mm -hmm. and uh, more uh, maybe persistent com communication patterns, we think that's... Uh, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And, um, um, and then I had a question about your uh, uh, P-hole result. How many LPs in the strong scaling result that you had? How many LPs were there total? Uh, 250 million. There's 250 million, 251 million in change. It was um, okay. roughly 32 times the number of MPI ranks. But but that's a strong scaling result, so it didn't depend on the yeah, yeah. yeah. So at that the was, high that end, was held. So we we knew at the high end it was 32 per, okay. Got it. and then it, that dove back. Yeah. So, Chris, in any of these uh, studies that you did, do you have any idea of the imbalance that, that was present? So, for P hold is actually in, on a, in, a, for in, the, in terms of balance, it's actually pretty well balanced. It's pretty well behaved in, a, you, you know, in, in, the, in the long run average. It may have sort of micro imbalances from you know, time to time where, you know, essentially, I think we had initially every, every um, rank, it's roughly about 16 messages per, or sorry, yeah, every LP gets 16 messages per. So at 32, it was roughly 512 events that you had pending. So that might fluctuate, you know, pin, your pending event list might go up to 700 and maybe drop down to 300 or something like that at any one time. But in the long run, it was pretty well balanced. So, so, the, so, so that, that's an interesting point is to see, is there any in, inherent sort of statistical imbalance that, that that could be improved.